the article said that we exceeded, we, we reached 20.75 C. We've never seen a temperature this high in Antarctica. The temperature was logged on the 9th of February, but it was just one reading, not part of a long-term data set. We also hit a record the previous week um, with 18.3 C on the Antarctica Peninsula. Okay, um, and uh, basically, according to the World Meteorological Organization, the, w the UN WMO, temperatures on the Antarctic Peninsula have risen by almost three Celsius over the past 50 years. Okay, so when we, we talk a lot about um, Arctic temperature amplification, um, you know, being at least three, maybe four to five times higher as you go to high, high latitudes. Well, on the Antarctic Peninsula, we've had 3C over the past 50 years, while the global temperature has probably increased, what, 0 0.6 to, or 0 0.8, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 over the last 50 years, something like that from memory. If it was 0.6, then 3C is five times warming, five times amplification, temperature amplification over the global average. If it's... Uh, if it's, uh, you know, 0.8 C that we've risen, it would be more like four times. 87% um, of the glaciers on the west coast have retreated in that time, and they're accelerating over, they've accelerated over the last 12 years. Um, in the Arctic, last July, we hit 21 Celsius, which was a temperature record, and this was at a base on the northern tip of Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Arctic. Okay, so let's go back here and let's see. Uh, first of all, yeah, this is the previous article uh, from um, the week previous to when that 20.7 was reached. We, got, we reached 18.3 um, Celsius and that broke a record, the previous record of 17.5, which was from March 2015. So this article does explain a couple of other things because the previous record was 17.5 set in March 2015. So on February 7th, thereabouts, we reached 18.3. And February 9th, we reached 20.75. So, you know, th this is really strange stuff. Um, again, it talks about the p whole peninsula heating about 3C over the past 50 years, according to the WMO. Um, and, uh, you know, the record. Um, so this is a record. Um, this is this is a very surprising record that is broken. It needs to be checked and so on. Um, but this uh, professor Narrowly Abram at Australia National University has done research on James Ross Island on the northern tip of the peninsula, Antarctic Peninsula, and she says it's an area that's warming very quickly. She said adding it can occasionally be warm enough to wear a t-shirt. So research in Antarctica might allow uh, t-shirt uh, contests. You know, I guess, you know, if you dip them in the ocean, you could have wet t-shirt competitions, <laughs> but it would still be cold water, I'm sure. Um, anyway, the current rate of warming in the region is unprecedented in the past 2,000 years. Um, and she, she talk, also they talk about that these shells act, ice shells act as plugs or corks. They keep the ice sheets behind them stable. When these ice shells melt, then the ice sheets um, move faster and, and go into the ocean contribute lots to sea level rise. Okay, um, here's a reminder of the lowest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica, minus 89.2 Celsius, you know, crazy crazy temperature. Um, now, so let's go back to Earth uh, null school here. So I set the date, I cycled back in days, and I went to um, February 5th, and I'm looking at the air, at the surface, the temperature. So anything over green, anything blue is below zero, green is above, and purple is very, very cold. And now let's cycle through uh, a day at a time. So this is uh, February 5th, February 6th. Now you can see the, it's above zero now in this whole region here. And we'll keep going. That's February 7th, February 8th, February 9th. Look at this huge warmth 
over this entire region, including the area. So this is where the researchers saw, you know, a station registering 20.75 Celsius. Let's continue a bit more. The 10th, the 11th, the 12th, and uh, the 13th. And you can see, you know, that the, the, that the green, um, the above zero temperatures have, have backed off from the Antarctic Peninsula. So let's go back uh, to the beginning, February 5th, where we were. And now let's look at the, you know, why did we get an incursion of the green air, of, of, of air above zero on this peninsula? So if we go to 250 millibar and look at the winds, we have our, our jet stream. So here's a sharp trough here. This is February 5th. Now look at this point here as we cycle through the days. So February 6th. February 7th, February 8th, February 9th. So look what's happened. This is when the record warm temperatures were registered here. What happened is a sharp trough of the jet stream moved over. Now, troughs of the jet stream in the southern hemisphere, you know, think of it, the warmer humid air is up here and it comes down into the trough and, you know, it's the colder Antarctic air that would come up here into ridges. This is opposite. If this was in the northern hemisphere, the Arctic would be up here, the cold air would come into troughs, the warm hum humid air goes into ridges. But it is, of course, it's upside down in Australia. So the, the, the warm air has come down and it's gone over the Arctic Peninsula. And we, so this is February 9th. And if we go the 10th, the 11th, and we see once again, the jet stream trough has moved up. And no surprise, the, the temperatures are much, much uh, colder, much, much closer to normal in, in that peninsula. Okay, um, so I talked about this article. Okay, let's define a couple terms. So, catabatic winds. Okay, so basically, catabatic winds, you have air at the top, so high elevation on the Antarctic ice sheet, in the center of Antarctica, the air is cooled. So by the ice surface and also it's, it's up higher elevation, lower temperatures, it gets very, very cold and it's very dense and it starts moving downhill. There's a pressure gradient. So the force of gravity causes the dense air to descend the slope and it builds up speed and builds up speed. It warms up a bit from the temperatures up here, but it's still very, very cold. And you, and you get these so-called catabatic winds. You know, it's cold, but it's, it's not as cold as the surrounding area because of um, adiabatic um, uh, compression, you know, or, or expansion as the air, it, the air is cold and tight, high density, as it comes down, it expands. Um, and it, as it, as it comes down, it, uh, you know, it heats, it, it heats up. Okay, uh, the air pressure increases. So yeah, it's a, a, adiabatic compression, so it expands and it, it, it contracts rather, and it heats up. Okay, so you get very, very high winds from these catabatic winds and they scour the, they remove the snow off parts of the ice shelf and they can scour the, the newer ice, the ice at the surface, which is young ice, and expose older ice from below, allowing for a horizontal ice core in certain locations. Now, tephra is a term um, for rock fragments and particles that are ejected by a volcanic eruption. Okay, I just wanted to define a few terms that I'll be talking about. Um, the name for the last interglacial is basically the Eemian. You can read about the Eemian. Started actually 129,000 years ago, ended about 116,000 years ago, also called marine isotope stage 5E. Last interglacial. Okay, um, and just an idea of where some of these winds are coming from is we've got this mountain range here and we get these winds coming down to lower elevations. So the cold air is up here. And as you come down, you get the gravity's pulling these cold, the cold dense air down and, and accelerating it, causing these so-called catabatic winds and then scouring the ice in some of these locations. So this is the area that, that is of most concern in the study. Okay, so let's go right to let's go to the study now, and I'm not sure how much detail I should be getting into because I could get into uh, quite a bit. But um, anyway, the paper is 
Uh, you know, early last interglacial ocean warming drove substantial ice mass loss from Antarctica. Okay, my cat's getting a bit restless. Hang on. Yeah, come on. Up you come. Um, okay, so many, many authors. Stefan Ramsdorf tweeted it out, you know, about a week ago, and I, that clued me to the paper. I read it, and I thought, well, maybe I should talk about this in a video, but it's... Uh, you know, it's uh, it it gets quite detailed. So I'll talk about it. Um, I'll I'll talk about some of the key points of it. So it it basically we want to find out basically how the Antarctic ice sheet will respond to rising temperatures. You know, and we're talking mostly about rising ocean temperatures. So if we look at the last interglacial or the so-called Eemian, one hundred and twenty-nine to one hundred sixteen thousand years ago. Um, it was, it had very warm, uh, there were very warm polar temperatures and global sea level, mean global sea level was six to nine meters higher relative to present day. Greenland ice sheet melt contributed about 0.2, it's estimated. I think that's a bit low actually. Ocean thermal expansion and melting mountain glaciers, about one meter of, of global mean sea level. So, so that's three when you add those together. So that means the Antarctica must have contributed basically three to six meters of sea level rise. Um, now, this could have been as high as 11, so that would be um, three to eight meters of sea level rise. Five at the most from West Antarctica and maybe three from East Antarctica. So, this, so there had to be, in order to get this significant Antarctic uh, melt, um, Leave my tripod alone, Shackleton. Hey, come on, up you come. Um, sorry, I'm just going to take a two-second break here. <sighs> it's about dinner time for him, so he, uh, if I didn't let him out, he was going to basically start eating the furniture and or my leg. So... Okay, so what this paper does is, yeah, yeah, so in order to melt all this Antarctic ice, there had to be a significant warming of southern ocean waters. Now, this basically is thought to result from a weakening AMOC, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So basically, the Arctic temperature amplification in the Arctic, um, it it creates huge amounts of fresh water in the Arctic. That water is lighter than, than the warm, warmer, saltier water below, so it doesn't sink down. So the, the AMOC um, does not bring so much heat up into the Arctic. That heat has to go somewhere, so it goes into the southern hemisphere, basically, and it warms the... Um, it warms the, the, the water under the surface, which then goes in, in and eats away at the, at the ice uh, that's sitting on bedrock on the West Antarctic ice sheet. So, they, they re so basically the study was to look at the blue ice record of ice sheet and environmental change from the Weddell Sea embayment. Okay, um, so let's talk about where the study is going. It's right here. So we're looking right here. Um, this is the Weddell Sea, so we're looking at the, at the ice melt, you know, along here, um, basically, for the most part, okay, um, okay, uh, which is at the periphery of the marine based, so West Antarctic Ice Sheet, so it's grounded on bedrock well below sea level, so it's called marine based. Now, the problem is, is there's major methane hydrate reserves underneath that ice sheet. So when that ice sheet goes, then you could get major releases of methane, which would then you know, be a huge positive feedback, causing greatly accelerated warming down there. So they looked at, um, they dated volcanic ash and tephra, they looked at microbial DNA analysis, um, and these things all showed that there, that there was substantial mass loss across the Weddell Sea embayment during the last interglacial. 
most likely driven by the ocean warming.